Okay, so now I have to share my screen. So pakimute na po ang ating mga uh, sarili. Ito lang. Okay. Ayan. Okay. Share screen. Ay. Okay. I need to make this view speaker view. Nakagamitan ko. The five C's of home intervention. Five C's home intervention. Intervention for children with special needs. Children. Okay. Hindi kita narinig, teacher Grace, kasi nakamute ka. Ay, teka. Sandali lang ah. I think you better... Sige. Teacher Grace, practice ka nga. Tingnan ko kung maririnig kita. Sige, before ko i-share yung Facebook Live. Let me hear you. Hindi kita naririnig. I can't. I ano mo, tanggalin mo, tapos saksak mo ulit. Try mo. Wala. Hindi namin naririnig. Hindi. Wala. Pero ako, Mami oh, Josie, naririnig mo ako. Yes, loud and clear. Ayan, yan, naririnig kita. O, oh, syempre, kaya hindi na naka-headset. Kaya lang, pag... Wag ka na lang mag-headset. Wag ka na lang mag-headset. Eh, pag uh -huh. yung aso. Okay lang, klaro naman, tsaka ano, oh, hindi ka naman the whole time. Oh, sige, sige, sige. I-mute ko lang para ano, thank you. Sige, sige. Oh, sige, sige. Wag na ako mag-headset. Sige, mas gusto ko rin hindi mag-headset. Oh, mas okay. Mas clear, loud and clear. Okay na. Sige. Mute na tayo. Okay. So, I'm going to share this na. Okay. So, nakalimutan ko isya. Okay. 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 Ayaw. Para hindi naman mukha ako yung makikita. Naka ano. Okay, ready. Go. Live. This meeting is being live streamed.
Good evening, good evening, everyone. Good evening, parents. Kumusta? How are you? Okay, good evening. And so, good morning, uh, good morning, good evening, Mami Kati. Okay, Mommy Mitch, Sasabilia, Mommy Jovi, from watching from Negros. Okay. Mommy Lilia, good evening. Mommy Cherry, kindly share this video to, to some, some of your groups para more parents could be able to join us. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Hello. So everyone, good evening. If you have some question, you're, you're thinking of anything that you can uh, ask, you can comment in the comment section. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yes, first, we are so excited for tonight's um, topic, the five C's of home intervention for special, for children with special needs, of course, but we will go through our routine first. So welcome to our practical guide for home intervention. We do this every Wednesday so we can be able to help our parents uh, to help their kids at home, to help their kids with special needs at home. So uh, we will recite again and uh, remind ourselves of our uh, foundational verse, which is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And this is the very reason why we look at our kids with so much hope and faith in God and in them, knowing that their future is in the hands of God. So another is we also believe in Proverbs 22, verse 6, that says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We strongly believe in training our kids so that when they grow up, they will always re uh, remember what we're doing with them and what uh, the things that we have taught them about. Okay, so, so for tonight, we have a sharing question. Okay, so please um, type your answer. So sharing, sharing lang tayo dito, no? So just type your answer in our comment section. 
what challenges have you experienced in helping your kids with special needs at home? Especially nowadays, for almost two years now, uh, we are the one who's really helping our kids at home. We became teacher parent to our kids. So what are the challenges that you have experienced? Just share it in the comment section. Okay, what challenges have you experienced in helping your kids with special needs at home? Is it communication in the area of communication? Is it in the area of discipline, academics? Is it in the area of diet, routine, rigidity? Are they so rigid they don't want to be, I mean, to change in routine or anything? Or is it sensory? Share, share with us. Okay. And um, yes, Mami Lilia says communication. <laughs> Teacher Grace also says communication. I think marami talaga no, sa communication. Communication. Ayan. Okay. So, ayan. Ako personally sa ano ko, um, more on discipline. Especially on the gadget, especially now, now that uh, Lola and Lolo is in town. <laughs> I mean, they are already with us now. So, medyo, uh, alam mo na, uh, marunong manligaw to with Lolo and Lola. And then, syempre, you give in na, di ba? <laughs> Sometimes ganyan. So, we're having a hard time right now with discipline. Oh, Sam says, communication and sensory, Mami Sheila Mi says, May, uh, A.R. Ram say communication. Mami Adeline, discipline and diet. Ayan. So, ma Mami Dina says communication because my son is nonverbal. Okay. So, uh, I hope uh, there will be lots of things that you're going to learn tonight. Okay. So, Without further ado, I would like to ask my friend. I'll just stop share this. Okay, I will I'll just ask my friend who's a long, long time friend of mine. Yeah, she's also a teacher like me before uh, because I used to also teach before. So, and uh, we're, we both have kids with autism and uh, she's also one of the moderators here in uh, Autism Family Support Group. So I, I would like to call Teacher Grace to introduce our very special guest. Hello, Teacher Grace. Yes, good evening, Teacher Jo, Dr. Luce. Good <laughs> evening, good evening to all our viewers, to all the parents and our friends. Okay, for tonight's topic, we will talk about the five C's of Home Intervention for Kids with Special Needs. And our speaker for tonight is a faculty of UP College of Education, Division of Curriculum and Instruction, Special Education Area since 2006. She has earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in education, all major in special education from the University of the Philippines College of Education. In 2020, she was confer conferred her doctorate degree, PhD in education, special education after finishing her dissertation, a career preparation framework for learners with disabilities toward tertiary placement. She has been handling courses in both the undergraduate and graduate levels in psychoeducational assessment, inclusive education, teaching and training learners with disabilities. She also supervises undergraduate student teaching or practicum courses, senior seminars, and mentors graduate students in completing their thesis and dissertations. Her passion and advocacies include guiding and supporting professionals, paraprofessionals, parents, and other stakeholders by providing appropriate education, training, and intervention for children with disabilities through individualized assessment 
and educational behavioral programs. Okay, parents, friends, and viewers, let us all welcome our speaker for tonight. Dr. Lutzisol Aplaon Vidal. Yes. A round Hello. of applause, please. Hello. Okay. Hi, Doc Lutz. Hello. Good evening. Good morning. Good noon. <laughs> Parents, mga nanay, tatay, mommies, daddies, mamas, papas, mudras, mudras, and everyone else in the family who are here tonight, including our friends who have joined us. Um, good evening from the Philippines. Good evening to all of you. So thank you very much, Autism Family Support Group, for inviting me um, to share some things that I know about our children with special needs. Um, I know that your advocacy um, is for children with autism, and yet you opened this up for all children with special needs. So I actually even invited others who don't have children with special needs, but are in the same situation that we are now for almost two years now. Diba? Kasi uh, what happened was we parents were suddenly, uh, parents and family members, no? I, I've heard also stories about uh, siblings um, attending to their uh, siblings with special needs. Um, we were suddenly put in this kind of situation where we are now the teachers and are now the carers and are now the intervention providers for our children. So um, I must be honest, I hesitated a bit <laughs> when Gracie asked me to, um, to uh, requested me to uh, have a talk tonight, but um, only because it's night time and I'm not so uh, uh, sanay. <laughs> I'm not so used to um, talking at night. So I'm afraid I might uh, fall asleep. In the <laughs> no, but actually it's, um, it's it's my pleasure and it's an honor to do this even I because then I know that even those who are not in the same time zone as the Philippines will be able to hear what I can share with you. So basically what I can share with you all uh, come also from information and feedback that I have had from parents who have children with special needs who, as I've said, uh, have suddenly become teachers uh, at this time when you know when the when the pandemic hit so let me share with you a summarized version of all the feedback because if i tell you all the feedback that they have about what happened to them it will take us more than five days <laughs> to do that no so let me summarize it in the five c's that i have um, um come up with for home intervention of our children because um uh i think many of our parents and many families would you know like to know how else they could maximize their time with their children um, while they are at home right now so let me start by sharing that the five c's that we really talking about tonight are the carer the child the context the content and strategies and connection okay so where i'm coming from is as uh, Gracie has mentioned, all my degrees are in special education. Okay, so um, I'm, and I'm also teaching. I'm teaching pre-service teachers. So, uh, pardon me, but most of the time I'll be in a teacher mode when I, when I talk to you. Some of my uh, classes, especially the master's uh, classes, are also uh, at night, no? That's why, um, I tend to really be in that kind of uh, mode when when I talk. Lalo na ginawa yung 8.30 at night. So I guess uh, I'll really be in that kind of mode. All right. But anyway, maybe what we can do is um, we will go through all of the five Cs. And then after that, you can ask questions. And I'll try my best to answer them. And if I can't answer them, then maybe we could all share together to come up with answers to our questions. Okay. So the first one of the C's is the carer. So the carer are the par the carer is the parent, the mommy, the daddy, even the sibling, even the the nannies. Those of you who have nannies for their children, no, um, we call them all of them. We call carers. So as a carer, we have heard 
uh, maybe not just once, but we have heard somehow the, uh, the statement that says, I can't pour from an empty can. Who of you has heard that? Diba? Um, they always say that we have to be filled with something before we can even share what it is that we need to share. So as carers, before we can even care for others, even if they are our children and they are our world, and we can actually just drop everything for our children, it's actually not really wise to be able to do that. And then suddenly you become empty and then you cannot share anymore. So for those of you, especially those who say that they are kind of having burnouts already, I think that is... Uh, the reason, no? because we give and give, and um, you know, as parents, especially as parents, we do not expect anything in return because we know that they are our children, we love them like unconditionally and everything. No? But based on parents' feedback, and even I, as a parent, I'm also a parent of three children, um, I noticed that when um, I'm kind of feeling empty, like for example, I don't. Um, in, in, in Filipino term, it's called hugot. Yung wala ka nang mahuhugot. Like you can't, you can't find anything in you anymore to be able to share. So uh, you're an empty can. You, you cannot anymore um, even take care of them because you're physically exhausted um, or you're mentally empty to be able to um, share with them. No? Because of course, um, the cliche says we are all humans. So, of course, we also need the care you know, that our children and all others who rely on us so much, uh, we, we also need that care. Okay? So, I like to, the analogy that I put here is like we're like a watering can. Okay? No matter how much you want to water, if you don't have water inside of you, then you'll not be able to share at all anything. You'll just be able to share air. <laughs> so, how do you do self-care, especially when you know that you are caring for a family that has a child with special needs? We all know this to be super exhausting, right? Who of you here has experienced that? Um, I'm sure in your group, many are sharing that, you know, they cannot sleep at night only because their son or their daughter is also awake in, at night and doesn't want to sleep or sleeps for just two hours and then wakes up the whole time. For in the 24 hours, no exaggeration, they sleep only two to three. Four, four hours would be like heaven for the, for the parents already. Okay, so especially for children with autism, it's re that's really a part of their profile. So children who, as the uh, other specialists say, are classically autistic or have classical autism, it's very difficult for them to, to sleep, no? So um, I'm sure that the very first thing that the parents would also want to do is to be able to sleep, <laughs> to be able to at least get a good uh, night's sleep or uh, good enough hours of sleep, no? So what we can do as carers, even if there is this purge in us, that we really want to be there all the time for our children and we want to be able to give their needs. But maybe you can have, you can do a step back and then you can try to analyze or try to evaluate also what needs you have. And when you, once you, you, have, you have determined those needs, then you start attending to those needs, as in literally attending to them. For example, if you don't have enough sleep, then probably you can ask somebody to. Um, relieve you with your shift so that you can do shifting when it comes to sleeping or maybe what you can do is for that during the time that the, your child sleeps you also sleep yeah, like like babies the right? uh, and the instruction what's, what's the instruction of your um, pediatricians when the baby sleeps you sleep so for children especially needs especially uh, I have had feedback um, about this from parents whose children are toddlers no, um, very difficult um, sleeping pattern. So that's what probably you can do. When your children eat, you eat. When your children sleep, you sleep. And that brings us to the second point that you have to be part of the routine. You do not only establish the routine for your children, you also have to establish your own routine. And if it takes you 
um, like, you know, if it takes that you have to also sleep when they sleep and you also have to eat and everything, you have to put that in your routine. Do not hesitate to give yourself time to attend to your needs. So the only way to be able to do that, especially when the children are 24-7 at home or that you don't only have a child with uh, special needs, you also have other children at home, then it's really wise for you to be able to have a routine yourself as well. Okay. The next thing that we should do as parents of children with special needs is to equip ourselves. Um, most of us, we, you know, we, we, we rant a lot. We, we complain a lot of how difficult it is to take care of our children, but we don't really, you know, um, get to the get to the fact that we really need also to be equipped ourselves. So, for example, we need to get to know the strategies for us to be able to address our the your, our children's behavioral needs. So, so it's not enough. Um, do you do you I know this? Do you experience this, parents? That it's not enough for you to just talk to them. Some of your children may not even understand what you're talking about. Some of your children may not even sit down and listen to you. So how do you? Uh, what strategies do you need for you to be able to address those kinds of behaviors? Or even when it comes to the academics. Okay, most of us, even if we are teachers ourselves, a uh, teacher. Grace and teacher Ajo can actually relate with this. Um, some of us or most of us have a hard time uh, tutoring our children, our own children, even if we are teachers. And that goes through for me as well. I have never tutored my own children, not just because I'm very bad at math, but also because we tend to, to quarrel and fight when it comes to anything academic at all. So to avoid the fights and to avoid, um, you know, trying to get at each other's throats, what do we do? We just find some other help. We, ha we find help from some other persons, no, but not us. So even if I'm a teacher, okay, so um, equipping yourselves is very important. There are many, right now, there are many resources, no, when the pandemic hit, um, thank God there are many resources that uh, we can go to. Uh, of course, we need a little bit of filtering to do that because not all of the resources that we see are actually very helpful. No? So it takes also some kind of studying for us to be able to know, uh, studying and filtering for us to be able to know which ones are legit or which ones are really helpful to us. Okay? And the last one probably that I can share, although, although I'm not saying that these are just the four that you need. No? It's just that if I keep on talking that we, we, we can't finish and go to the next seat. So, but these are the ones that I find important from the feedback that I've heard. So the last one is accept your limitations. And when you do, once you do, you ask for help. Okay, so for example, um, there are parents that I've heard who blame themselves too much for what has happened to their children, especially the mothers. Okay, the mothers tend to, well, probably because, you know, the babies come from their tummies. So definitely, they think that they did something wrong. So they keep blaming themselves until they are empty already of whatever self-esteem and um, self-confidence that they might actually have if only they accept their limitations. Um, accepting limitations also means that we should be able to say that it's that's enough. We, we should be able to say, no, I can't do that anymore. We should be able to say that I am almost empty, so let me just replenish before I can attend to you. Okay, and then also, you know, be humble enough to ask for help. I I know that we all pray. We all pray that we would just have the strength. We would have. We would always have the motivation for us to be able to help our children and our family. But beyond that, we also have to listen. Maybe God is also telling us. Wait, you're exhausted already. You're almost empty. You need to replenish. Say no to a particular task that you know will drain you. So asking for help um, sometimes is difficult, especially when we, when we are so used to being the Wonder Woman of the house, right? The, the mothers especially. Um, but don't you know that 
sometimes we do ask for help, but it's just the, you know, the, not, the, not the right approach. So what do we do when we ask for help? We rant, we nag, we, we complain, and yet we do. So we say, enough, I can't do it, but you still do it. Okay? At the end of the day, you haven't really said no because you still did it. It's just that along with the doing it, you were complaining or you were nagging. So maybe if we turn those nagging moments and ranting moments into more effective ways of communicating, then probably we can get the help that we need. Like for example, be more specific with who you are talking to because it really, diba? it's our tendency to just talk and talk. Sometimes it's the refrigerator who gets all our rants. The refrigerator is all full, full of bad and, um, and uh, negative thoughts and uh, complaints because of us. Because every time we open it, that's where we talk. Okay? So the refrigerator cannot help us that way. It will, not, it will only listen to us, but it cannot help us. So how about talking to the right person? Like, Daddy, may I please talk to you? I need help. So the, these are the things that I need help with. Can you please do this? So if we don't actually ask and ask specifically, then what happens is we don't get the help that we need. And everyone in the house will just think that you're the Wonder Woman and you will always be there to, um, to be, uh, you're always around to do everyone else's jobs all the time, okay? Now, I think the very the bottom line of all of these things that we want to do for ourselves when we do self-care is that we don't feel guilty about it. So if, for example, you need time to rest because you really feel that you're going to get sick if you don't rest or you're going to, you know, mentally, you know that you're going to go into a breakdown if you don't rest your mind, if you don't rest um, at least for a good number of even just hours, not even uh, days, no? Then when you do that, and whatever it is that you think can help you, when you do that, do not feel guilty about it. Like, for example, some of us, we love to watch K-dramas because that's the only time we can rest. And yet, when someone comes into the room and sees us watching that on our, on our gadgets, what do you do? You put it down and you say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So why do you have to say sorry about it if it, that's... You know, if that's something that you would want to do, you want to talk to your friends, so you go on Zoom. But once somebody comes to you and says, Ma, then you stop no, and you go. So, but they're always there and you get distracted. So, what do you do? You put it in your routine. If it takes you, like, you know, a um, good part of your weekend just for that, go ahead. The important thing, I think, is to make everybody understand that you have different needs at home. Not only your child with special needs have needs, you also have needs. And you would want those needs also to be um, attended to. You know? So like me, for example, I have a Saturday night date always with my um, uh, teammates from my, my former swimming club. So we always have that. And do we do really uh, very nice things that I mean you know we, we just talk that's what we do we talk we even reminisce, reminisce about our past and everything the memories and everything while we were swimming and it gives us that uh, wonderful feeling you know that you were once young you also had a life and all of those things no? so um, try to get into that uh, mode where there you think that you need that and you give it to yourself and you don't feel guilty about it Okay? I know it's difficult, but you, you can do it. Okay? One of these days, you try it. <laughs> All right. The second C that we um, need to talk about is the child. Okay? Most parents come to me and say that my child has a problem. But I always tell them, I always ask them, um, your child has been given to you. You even ask God for that child. Most of us ask for that, diba? Right? And yet, now we complain that the child is the problem. So when I try to analyze the situation, I get to the point where I see that the problem is actually not being able to know the needs of your children. So especially for those who, whose children are, you know, um, they, they have behavioral concerns and issues. Those children who are nonverbal, no, they cannot talk, they cannot say their needs, no. 
um, those children who cannot even organize their thoughts for them to be able to tell you what exactly they need. Or those who you, those who you ask, what's the problem? And then they tell you nothing. But the way they behave is, you know, it's problematic. So I think the best way to approach our children, especially at this time, when they are with us 24-7 is for us to be able to know their needs. So how do, we, how do we know our child's needs? But more importantly, I would like to think also that, I, I would like also to share that it's equally important to know why we want to know those needs, okay? So to know our child's needs, uh, these are the things I can share. One is it would be best for your children to, uh, to be assessed. I've heard parents, um, you know, asking other parents and asking help about what to do with their children, especially, um, you know, uh, behaviors that come along um, during the life of the child um, that, you know, they were not expecting for the child to do. Like, for example, uh, yeah, the one that I mentioned, sleeping patterns. And then there are also some um, parents who complain about their children's diet. Remember the activity we did before this, the one from um, Nami Josie, no? You had a, some kind of um, um, survey of your concerns right now about your children, right? So if we, if we just look at them, one behavior uh, at a time or uh, one by one, all the behaviors, no, one by one, then we would think that we have a ton of behaviors in our hands and it's overwhelming. We cannot do anything about it. We feel like, Tomorrow, there's going to be another behavior that we will discover about our children. And this is heightened because the children are now at home. Before, they used to be in school, or at least a good part of the day, they are in school. So um, that part of the day, you do not see or you do not witness or you do not, the, the, the behaviors that the children exhibit, you don't actually see. But now you see them all because they are all with us. So I think if your child has not been assessed, uh, and don't get me wrong, assessment, by assessment, what I, um, what I want to uh, uh, share with you is, uh, what I want to share with you and what I want to advocate is the kind of assessment that would actually give you a comprehensive profile of your child, okay? You also want to have an assessment that's purposive, meaning it does not end with just a diagnosis alone. Okay, we are so used to going to our specialist just to ask for the diagnosis. And that, ask, that is actually also fine. However, if you notice, why do you still keep on asking why my child has this behavior? Why my child has this? And then another parent says, my child does not have that, but has this kind of behavior. So by that alone, we know that children are unique. So even their behaviors are unique to each one. You know? So the kind of assessment that's individualized should also be purposive. There should be something that can be done after the diagnosis. Because if you keep on going for diagnosis, most likely that will not change. Year in, year out, even month, month in, month out, that diagnosis will not change. Okay? You know why? Because disabilities, after all, you know, our special needs are not diseases. So if they were diseases, then we just take in medicine and then they'll go away. But because they are not, they are conditions, they are disabilities, then, and I'm sorry to say, it's lifelong. Most of the disabilities of children are lifelong. Autism is lifelong. Intellectual disability is lifelong. Okay? Even when there are, <coughs> excuse me, even when the causes of some of the disabilities, like for example, um, the child has, uh, was growing uh, or developing quite well, and then something happened, like a, um, a brain injury or something like that, and the child has in the intellectual disability, there's no possibility that the child will go back to being quote unquote normal or will grow or develop um, normally as he should or she should. So meaning, we should be able to get an assessment that will not only deal with the diagnosis, um, but also be able to deal with what to do after the diagnosis. 
are there assessment um, procedures like that? Yes, like psychoeducational assessment is comprehensive. It takes the child's IQ, cognitive level, um, behavioral uh, profile. It even takes the child's career profile if there's a need already, if the uh, child is going through that already. So the purpose of assessment are plenty. One of them, of course, is to be able to establish the profile of the child. Another one is placement. School placement is very important and you know, assessment does that. When you are preparing uh, and designing programs for children, like their um, IEP, you would need an assessment that, is, uh, that would actually go through all the developmental areas for you to be able to come up with also a, a very comprehensive program afterwards. Assessment should be periodic. It should not be just a one-time, big-time thing that you go to the specialist, the specialist tells you that the child has autism, and then you go home with that information alone. No, you have to have, you need to know also what to do as in the very specifics, like how do I teach my child? What do I teach my child? All of those should be taken from an assessment procedure. It's, the assessment itself is not the end all. It should, the assessment is just the procedure. It's just the process. The one that comes out of the assessment is what we actually need. Okay, and we'll go to that later. You can also get information from your support persons. If your child is in school, then you can get information from the teachers, from the therapist, if your child goes through intervention with um, therapists, and other specialists. Your specialists, where you go for your assessment, where you go for your checkup, should also be able to give you information that you would need for you to be able to attend to the behaviors and teach your child. Now, the family, you, the home, is also a source of information. It's actually the biggest source of information. So if I were the parent, if I were you, what do you need to do? You need to be able to observe your child. Take time to jot down what you observe about your child, especially if you haven't done that before. Like, for example, when the pandemic hit, a lot of the parents in 2020 came to me and told me, um, what are the points that I need to be looking at when I observe my child? Because as of now, all I can see is a fur ball going around inside the house, jumping up and down and going up and down the stairs, eating everywhere, uh, spreading all the, the, the kalats and the, everything inside the house. And so I told them, you know, you need to get a paper and pencil. Uh, you need to really write down like every day, even just bullets, okay? That will be your kind of journal or your diary where you put down, you jot down all of the things that you observe from the behaviors of your child to the way that child, your child talks to other people and interacts with other people, that's psychosocial, to the way they um, attend to their needs or the way you attend to their needs because most children, most parents attend to their children's needs. So, you also need to know how independent they are. What are the things that they can actually do for themselves that you don't need, that they don't need your help? What are the um, um, communication struggles? How does your child tell his needs? How does he say, for example, when he needs to eat? How does he uh, approach you when he needs um, to uh, sleep, for example? Does he just, uh, you know, have a meltdown each time he needs to sleep? Or does he poke you, he asks you, he points, all of those things you need to jot down, okay? Once you have that information, you will be able to talk to your specialist. If the specialists are into that kind of assessment where they get all the information, then you would be able to honestly and you know very objectively tell your specialist what you have observed, okay? You can even use the existing tools and materials that you have at home. It doesn't have to be the academic or um, uh, therapeutic materials that we uh, that you need to buy. You don't need to buy them. Okay, whatever things you have at home can be considered tools and materials. The way your child um, the way your child switches on the light and switches on the electric fan and um, puts down the the shuts down the um, air conditioning unit, the way your child opens the refrigerator and 
looks for things he needs. All of those things are information and all of those things are materials that you can use for you to get the information. You can engage them in practical home activities for you to be able to see how well they do it, how efficient they are. Like for example, have them brush their teeth all by themselves without you helping so that you know how they brush their teeth. Oh my gosh, my child eats the toothpaste instead of putting, putting it on the, and then brushing his teeth. See, so all of those are information that you can um, use later on. No? When there is already somebody who can direct you towards making the program for your child, then it would be easier because you already have that, those information. Okay? Now, what, I, what is the why of all the, of these things? No? We would want to get all of this information for one very important thing. Who of you have heard uh, IEP? IEP is an individualized educational plan. All children with special needs must have IEP. And I actually, I am um, still wondering up until now why there are parents who came to me, not only parents, but there were teachers also came to me um, last year and even early this year asking me how they would get an IEP. The parents asked how they get how they would get an IEP, and the teachers, SPED teachers at that, were asking me how to make an IEP. When in fact, the IEP is the, the major thing that you need to do when you are a SPED teacher. So all you SPED teachers out there, you should be able to know how to make an IEP because this time around, the parents really need the IEP. You do, not, you do not just show them the IEP like it's a report, mommy, here's your child's IEP. Now you really have to endorse the IEP to the parents so that they have a guide as to what to do, what to teach their children, how to go about teaching their children. So an IEP is something that is an assessment results based. An assessment is not necessary, does not necessarily have to be a clinical or formal assessment. There's also what we call it an informal classroom assessment that the teacher, the SPED teacher who's supposed to be, has been trained to do that, um, does that, not the informal uh, assessment, for the teacher to be able to come up with an IEP. Okay, so as I've said before, an assessment, um, uh, you know, uh, attending to our children does not end with the assessment alone. We need to have something out of the assessment, and that's the IEP. So an IEP comes from all assessment results. That's why as much as possible, the assessment should be comprehensive. It should not be like a, just a strip of paper that tells you where to go, what to do. It should be a comprehensive, um, it, a comprehensive uh, report of the results of the assessment. And it also has to have a part two, which is the IEP or the program of priorities. Now, sometimes it's called the program of priorities. The program of priorities um, supposed to be composed of the guidelines, what you need to do for your child, and also the recommendations when it comes to the priorities. What are the priorities? The priorities are the skills that the child needs to learn at this point up until one year because an IEP is supposed to be runs for one year before you do an assessment again and so that you can modify your IEP, revise it because you already have another set of um, assessment results, okay? So an IEP is comprehensive because it covers all developmental areas. It's supposed to cover um, psychosocial, language communication, independence training or self-care or self-help. It should cover even vocational and pre-vocational. It should cover even behavioral. It should cover, you know, everything. It even has a part where there are guidelines for the parents and the home members to be able to know what they exactly need to do at home. Like, for example, um, uh, the arrangement of the rooms and the areas where all of the activities will be going, uh, the, the, all of the activities will be um, engaged in, you know, all of those things should be placed in the IEP. For those children who are uh, in inclusive uh, classes, no, an IEP is very important because that's where the grades of the children come from as well. Okay, so an IEP becomes now like your, uh, because it, it's complete, eh? it has the goals, okay? 
both long-term and um, uh, we call it terminal, both the terminal goals or objectives, the en route objectives or the step objectives, it also has to have also the activities you know, or the lesson plans for the teachers out there. It should also have that, including the evaluation, the instructional evaluation okay, it's for, for us to be able to know if that child has really learned that particular lesson that has been taught. Okay, So it's that um, complete supposed to be. It should be doable. And at this point in life where it's almost two years now and we're still at home, it should be applicable and it should be contextual as well. Meaning it, it does not only run, it's not only exclusive to the school where the child used to go to, it can also be applied at home. Okay. More on the IEP, maybe later on, we can talk about that as well in our next, if there's a next um, <laughs> webinar, now we can talk about that as well. And then we go to context, okay? Have you heard um, the saying that goes, my child becomes where he is placed? This is actually very uh, applicable to children with special needs or children with disabilities. And this is one of the reasons why us, no, the UP College of Education, special education area, advocate for inclusive education. Why? Because we have noticed, and this also, and, uh, and this one also comes from the feedback of many, many parents. Okay? I am involved in assessment, so I know um, the feedback of parents. They would always tell me, um, why is it that my child, when placed in a classroom full of children like him goes out of that classroom having all kinds of behaviors. Are you telling me that autism is contagious? Why does he have all of these behaviors? And I would always tell the parents, based on my experience, my studies, and um, all the feedback from parents it, and teachers, it's not that autism or any other kind of disability is contagious. Remember, it's not a disease. So it's definitely not contagious. However, children will, were built to be imitative. Children imitate. They imitate sounds. They imitate actions. They imitate everything. So if they see behaviors of others being exhibited right in front of them, there's a tendency that they would also imitate those behaviors. And so... Your child who goes into that classroom having only three behaviors that are non-positive and atypical comes out of that classroom with 10 more. And then you get overwhelmed and of course you get so mad. Why? Why, Why is my child now having all of these guys? He doesn't throw tantrums. Now he knows how to throw tantrums when he was placed there. Okay, so... This is why we always would want children to be where typically developing children are. I mean, we put CSN, we put children especially, where the typically developing children are. Because at least if they do imitate the behaviors, they will, they will imitate behaviors of typically developing children. This is also the reason why we don't like children to be what locked up in their room and not uh, being able to interact with their siblings and all other people in the house, okay? Because that's where they can imitate the behaviors. If you lock them up in the room with their gadget, then they will tend to imitate the gadget, okay? That's, that's probably the only thing moving there, the one that they see in their screens, and so they imitate that, okay? If you don't, um, you don't deliberately put them where other children are, and not even just children. At this time when there's a pandemic and we're all at home, you need to put them where the adults are and all the other people of the house are. If there are no children in the house, then at least let them be with you and all the humans in the house. Okay, so that that's where they will get the behaviors from. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself actually. <laughs> so why do we need to contextualize? Because we want to make decisions along these okay, areas. First, school placement. So if you notice, there is only one bullet under school placement. And what is that? School placement should be inclusive, period. No, uh, for me, uh, at least for me. Okay? I don't know with others. Maybe you have your own opinions as well. But this one, you know why we, I advocate so much for inclusion and inclusive education? 
for one very important thing, okay? The UNCRPD, actually, it's not just that. Eh? It's the Salamanca Statement also in 1994. And it's also the UNCRPD, United Nations Convention for the Rights of People with uh, Persons with Disabilities in 2006, also, also says that we should be inclusive. We should be able to provide children with opportunities to be with others. We should be able to provide them not only just a least restrictive. I can still hear that sometimes. Not that anymore. It's not just least restrictive. It should really be inclusive. No questions asked. Okay? Why? Because it's their right. Parapatan siya. It's their right. So if we don't actually put them where other children are, we are trampling on their rights. And that's bad, right? Those are They are your children. You love them so much. You want to give them everything. And yet, you don't want them to be with other children who are typically developing. So it's not, it's not actually nice. So we want to, make, to be able to choose the school that would actually help our child um, belong to a classroom or belong to a community where there are other children and not just um, himself and not just children like him or her, okay? Uh, inclusive actually does not only mean that the school should be inclusive, uh, the home should also be inclusive. Sometimes we are guilty about this, okay? Not for our children with special needs, but our other children, diba? What do we do? We put in a good, what, 90% of our effort towards our child who has special needs. And yet, we give only about 10% to those who don't have. To those pa yan, ha? meaning if you have three children, your child with special needs gets 90. And then the 10% is reserved only for those two who are typically developing. So they just get five and five. So it's also unfair because being inclusive also means that we have to uh, attend to our other children, make sure that they too are granted their rights because it's also their right to, to belong. Okay, So what do we need to do for us to be able to be inclusive at home? One is we routinize. Okay, This is one very practical thing that I always say, I'm, I'm like a ano na, sirang plaka na ako, like a <laughs> uh, broken record. I always say this over and over again. It's very important to have our children, uh, to have a routine at home. Why? Because uh, for many things. For one, it gives the it gives us a chance to be able to attend to the behaviors of our CSN. Okay, a routine makes sure that the child gets to be compliant and gets to follow a certain order of things. Remember, children with autism, children with ADHD, uh, they have they do not know how to organize. They don't even know how to organize themselves and their behaviors. No, so you should be the one to start that off with a routine. Um, by routine, we mean that there should be a time slot for everything, and it should be comprehensive as well. Okay, your specialist who did your assessment should be able to do that to give you recommendations in terms of how to sequence the activities. Okay, because we don't also want our children, we don't also want to wake them up early in the morning just to do nothing, diba? So we have to fill out our day as well. Children with autism and uh, children with autism sometimes also manifest, not just sometimes, eh, most of the time also manifest ADHD um, signs. No? So children with autism also have ADHD behavior. So they would be inattentive, they would be impulsive, they would be hyperactive as well. No? So for those children, a routine actually makes sure that they have something to do right at that time. So it makes sure that they have no idle time. Why? Because when children have idle time, that's when all the atypical behaviors come in. For children with ADHD who do not have atypical behaviors, all of the non-positive behaviors will come in because, you know, they have nothing to do. So of course, they'll think of other things to do, like destroy your electric fan and never put it back again. Diba? That's what they do because they find things to do. That's just how wired they are, diba? So 
it's really very important to keep them constructively busy. And a routine can do that. I can actually talk about a routine like for days, if you like, <laughs> because that's one thing that I really would like to share. No? Now, some ask me, how about our children who get so rigid that they don't like to change? Uh, they don't like changes to happen. So would a routine be okay? Because the routine actually makes you not change. No? Nagiging stable um, ang kanilang schedule. And well, based on experience, children who are who have rigidities, children who don't who have maladaptation to changes and are routinized are still better than children who have maladaptation to changes and just react towards certain activities that they don't like to do or that actually change their routine. So it's always better to be, or for, for example, children who are very fixated with, with um, everything, no? fixated with things, fixated with routines, fixated with schedules. So would that be good for them? Well, as I've said, if the children get fixated into a routine, that would still be better than getting fixated with something. And then that's the only thing the child does. A child who is fixated with water will take a bath the whole day. Is that actually better than being fixated with a routine that says that each and every hour you have something to do. I think I'll go for the routine. Diba? And then we can just do some changes along the way so that sometimes you know the sequence of the activities actually get uh, changed. No? So our routine is very comprehensive as well. So it will make you, as the parent or as the carer, have time for yourself as well. Diba? Remember, I said you should be part of the routine. But of course, it should be a synchronized effort. Do not Make your children feel that they are actually being punished by way of telling them to go follow their routine. So how do you do that to make sure that it's not a punishment? You ask the other family members and even the adults get involved in the routine. So you synchronize all your schedules. Okay. Um, at this time when everybody is at home and yet everybody is expected to, expected to do his own thing, like the children go to school, have online classes, the parents have our work from home. No, well, at least us here in the Philippines, that's what's happening right now, especially in Manila. You know, we can't move about because it's we're still on lockdown. So um, what you can probably do is to make sure that um, the, the activities don't um, collide with each other. Like for example, uh, me at home, what we do is that there should always be a good bandwidth for the one who is live. So for the, one, for the child who is having online classes and synchronous classes, then the, the one that um, can give way okay, will not have that one. The others will have it some other time. Okay? We can also compromise. If all else fails, you can always compromise. Okay? So for example, you children want to do this and um, you know that it's not something that they're allowed to do. So some children, for example, want to go out right now one, uh, forcing you to uh, let them out of the house, maybe you can make a compromise. No? So like my one of the families that I know of, they have actually made plans already of going outside of the country. And what they do is every month, they study a country. <laughs> they study a country, like what can be seen there, um, what's the mode of transportation there, how much will be everything. No? So they already have, I think, three countries that they have studied as a compromise for not being able to go out right now, okay? All right, intervention. We make decisions along intervention based on assessment results, definitely, okay? We cannot just, you know, um, uh, we cannot just decide by ourselves what intervention would be good for our children. Because most of the time, the manifestations of behaviors and other um, challenges that our children uh, exhibit are actually just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of other things that we can see down there, we cannot see down there that need to be attended to. Sometimes what we do is um, we make the intervention based on what we see. That's the reason why it doesn't work. For, for some, uh, most interventions do not work because we only um, attend or give the intervention to the one that we see. We do not look at the roots. We do not look at where it comes from or the cause of it. That's why uh, intervention gets to be challenging. And some of us, after so many years, say the intervention did not work at all. No? So like, uh, ano lang yan eh? Parang ganito lang. For example, uh, you see your child having problems with reading. So you give your child 
um, an intervention such as uh, a reading tutorial, for, for example, then you see your child having a problem with math. So you get a math tutor. So now the child has two tutors. Okay, now not knowing that the root of the problem is there's a communication or a language communication problem with the child and what needs to be attended to are the language communication behaviors and the language communication skills and not just the ones that you see on top. Okay, so the, mo the important thing is we really need to know what are the needs of your children in those areas. No? So it has to be needs-based. Intervention has to be needs-based. It should be developmental. Do not force a certain um, intervention for your child when you know that uh, it's not any more apt or it's not appropriate for the child's age or for the child's behaviors. You know, they can outgrow intervention. Um, it should always be in support of school placement. It should not be, well, in an inclusive perspective, it should not be the be all and end all. Okay, Our intervention should always be our supports. That means that while the child is in school or placed in school, as long as they are school-based, I'm sorry, I, as long as they are already school bound, okay, they can be put in school already, then you need to be able to support that with the intervention that's needed. If the intervention is something that can be done also while the child is inside the inclusive um, school, no, or uh, not naman while inside, but it can be uh, an, uh, an ancillary or a, a, a part of the school system, then that would be best. But, you know, in the Philippines, that's not yet the practice. You know, we get that from private, the intervention that we get are from private um, um, institutions and uh, centers. No? Um, and of course, it has to be towards the child's holistic development. Now, sometimes what we do is we prepare our children um, by way of giving them intervention. No? So I always ask the parents, what are you preparing the child for? And most of them would answer me that they are preparing their children for school. But the thing is, when will they be able to graduate from the intervention enough for them to be placed in the, in the regular uh, gen ed school? Because most of the time, what happens? After, what, 14 years, the the intervention people tell you, okay, you can go to school now. But the child is, what, 14? So where should we place the child? The child cannot just immediately go to grade, what, to high school? Because 14 is already high school. So what happens? Second year? So what happens? You put your child in grade one because that's where he will be. He's, that's where they say he is ready for. So would you actually allow a 14-year-old in a grade one class where he is called kuya, tatay, or lolo, grandpa? That's how he's called in that class. Diba? Is that actually inclusive? Is that actually beneficial to the child? Remember, one of the main reasons why we put children in the school placement that's inclusive is because we want him or her to be able to imitate the behaviors of the others. How will he imitate grade one students? Sige nga, a 14-year-old imitating grade one, that's actually worse, di ba, than, um, than uh, what do you call this, than not placing him uh, there at all, no? or placing her, him or her somewhere else. So it's very important that we know the right interventions for our children. Basta make sure that this comes from the perspective of the one who did the assessment. Because... Always, if it's that and it's in support of school placement, that's when you cannot go wrong as long as it's needs-based and as long as it's support, it's a support, okay? And then our community should also always um, be the context, okay? We place, remember what we said, where we place our children, that's, that's what they become. So if you place your children in a community where everyone else is like him, he will become like that forever, so include him always also in community affairs and community activities. Um, it's good that you have your own community of um, autism um, support families. No, that is also fine and that is also okay. But do also have activities 
towards or activities that would involve typically developing children. So the siblings, for example, who are typically developing, you can always involve them. Okay. So the community should not only be supportive, it should be something uh, engaging. No? People, uh, children with special needs can also participate in the activities there. And it should also always have something, uh, always have the opportunities throughout the lifespan of the child and not just now. No? Um, try your very best to create a community that's inclusive and you know, you will be supportive also of all the other things that you made decisions about that are also inclusive. Okay, so for content and strategies, this is something that I learned from my many years instead. Because I would always find, um, I would always hear at least one parent tell me that a specialist has told um, her to take your child at home because we cannot do anything about your child. The child cannot go to school. The child cannot go. An intervention will not solve your problem about your child. So take your child at home. So, well, much as I would believe, I believe also that there are things that can be done at home. No, um, being at home is not, it's not, um, it's not actually, a, what we call this, it's not prison after all. Okay. Especially at this time when there's a pandemic and we're all at home, diba? our home now becomes also the, the, a place where the child can study, the child can be also, can learn also. No? But I do believe that even if children are, have delays and children are the least teachable, meaning, um, you know, sometimes they say that uh, they, the child will not develop anymore. I think it's still, uh, we can still give it a shot and always teach anyway, right? Why? Because remember the, remember the um, verse that you read before this? Train your child. Right, so it doesn't say there that you should stop sometime. Actually, we don't stop being parents, right? I have a 27 year old and I have not stopped being a parent, and you will experience that you will, you will always be teaching, parenting, caring for your child, even if they grow old. So, in a, the perspective of teachers, we should always teach them, even if we think that you know they're not teachable anymore. Um, and we can teach in many ways. It doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be a direct teaching all the time. Teaching can take many forms and also learning okay, for our children. So all I can share is if you ask me what to teach and that would be the curriculum and how to teach and that would be the strategies or the instruction, the first thing that we should remember is to individualize. Remember what I said? Get it from the assessment results. From there, when you already have your IEP, or just a priority, uh, uh, just, a, just a program of priorities, then you can now individualize. Meaning, we do not teach the same things to other children. We can ask, we can ask the opinions and uh, the help okay, of other parents, for example, and how they dealt with their children. But we always have to take into consideration that whatever it is that you're experiencing about your child and the way you teach your child, is always different also from others. You can only you can only get tips, you can only get some ideas no, from others, but you know, you have to study your child and you have to make sure that uh, whatever it is that you um, teach your child is really customized for your child. An IEP actually will do that for you. You need to be able to prioritize because this is, you remember what I said, the uh, disabilities are lifelong, meaning you cannot just Put them all together in one year. I am going to teach you just for one year. I want you to, you know, take everything in. Uh, children learn um, in different paces. Uh, children learn through different strategies. And most of the time, for children with disabilities, the pace is really slow. Okay, so we really need to be patient about that. We need to summon all the patience that we, uh, that we can have for us to be able to teach them properly. You also have to practicalize. What do I mean by that? All lessons, even those that are academic, can actually be taught in the practical way. After all, what is the reason why we put children in school? The main reason is that we want them to be able to use the skills that they have learned in school and even the behaviors that they have learned there, you know, that they may be able to apply it in real life. 
So now that we're all at home, why don't we go directly to the application? So if you teach, for example, your children about decimals, if you're at that point when you need to teach your children about math, teach them through money because that's, after all, the bang ending ng lahat ng yan is money. Diba? I mean, well, for the decimals. Fractions. Fractions are very difficult for me. It took me a lot of you know to uh, time to be able to understand it. So if for you to be able to understand that better, where do you take your child? At home, you take your child to the kitchen. That's where, where all the fractions go. Uh, that's where all the fractions can be taught, right? One. And even other behaviors, not necessarily skills, no, have to be taught. No? I'm sorry to say this, but you know, in my experience, there is no such thing as that ch my child with special needs just got over a particular behavior. Um, almost there, maybe they got over it through intervention through strategies that you have used to teach them. But it's not like, you know, typically developing children who we don't really need to teach uh, all the time. For example, typically developing children will just hug you and they want to show you how much they love you. Children with disabilities, especially those with autism, diba? you need to be able to teach them how to hug, as in literally how to put your hands together or how to put your hands are your arms around your mom, and that's called hugging. Okay, I have had plenty of um, children like that um, in my experience uh, uh, in assessment, who the parents want to be taught, who the parents want to teach to to be more affectionate, to be able to you know express themselves. I saw kanina. I saw in your in the survey one. I think two or more said that they're having difficulty with communication with their children. Uh, I think Grace was even one of them. Um, actually, the reason behind that, or my, my observation behind that, is that children with autism, for children with autism, communication, speech and communication, are what we call the last to go. Meaning, even with plenty of intervention, children grow up, uh, grow up with communication struggles when they have autism. And this goes through as well for children with ADHD. Children with ADHD, a good 99% of them have communication problems. That's why um, as a specialist, I always, the first thing that I ask is, did your child talk late? And their answer would always be yes. Okay, why? Because, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the reason behind why communication is like that, but I only know that it's the last to go. Meaning, even if your children are behaved already and your children have matured enough and your children are quite okay already performing well and you know, the language communication will always still have lags. No? So because, as I said, it's one of the last to go. All right. So we need to be able to remember that when we do all of these things, no? especially home intervention, you always have to take into consideration your child's profile, as in holistically. So it's quite difficult if you ask me, for example, how do I attend to this particular behavior, very specific behavior? Like, for example, how do I make sure that the child sleeps, my child sleeps well? How do I make sure that, um, what else? What are the questions that, your, that parents would always have or ask um, other parents about? Um... How do I teach my child to talk because my child is nonverbal? My child plays with, um, I think what, sometimes I hear this, no? my child plays with his feces, um, puts it all over the place. Uh, how do I deal with that? How do I deal with my child who does not want to stop um, getting fixated on a particular thing? How do, okay, so all of those things. Always remember this. When you do home intervention, and not just home intervention, for everything, okay, even in school, even um, your intervention in the centers, always remember that when we do intervention, it has to be holistic. It has to be, it has to, what do you call this? It has to be uh, comprehensive enough that you would be able to address all the others that might be causing the behaviors that the child has or the delays in the skills that the child has. No? So my tip to you is this. Always try to address the behaviors first. 
Okay, because when we address behaviors, in particular, behaviors such as not paying attention, getting impulsive, getting hyperactive, having atypical behaviors, physical, motoral stimulations, um, verbal stimulations, sensorial issues, um, repetitiveness, rigidities, all of these things. No? Once we have addressed those, but I'm not saying that you need to like stop everything and just attend to the behaviors. What I mean is you have to prioritize the behaviors. Once you prioritize that, for example, the child now can sit better, can attend better, can listen better, does not stand up all the time, does not anymore, you know, uh, the, the rocking, for example, has been limited already. The talking inappropriately has been limited. Once that's done, then you can be sure that all other areas will follow. That child will be more independent, you know, because he listens now, you know, so he can follow your instructions. The child now will be, uh, will, can now listen and uh, what you call this, can now understand the teacher's lessons because now he can sit better and attend better. So always attend to the behaviors. Make it the priority and all other areas will follow. And make sure that it's holistic. Do not, as much as possible, my advice is do not address the behaviors as they come. Like my child suddenly is rocking. What do I do with this? My child is suddenly doing like this. What do I do with this? Instead, look at the cause of that. So when your child rocks, when your child does hand play, what happened before that? I mean, what are the triggers? What are you? So you need to find out where it's coming from. Ah, because the child has nothing to do now. He's idle. So that's when he does it. So through your observations, remember your observations. When you, once you have determined that, then you can proactively address the situation like for example you do not wait for your child to rock and do like this because you know that that will come when the child is idle so for ch the child not to be idle what do you do you establish your routine okay see so actually we can have more of that later on <laughs> no um because there are plenty of strategies that can be shared especially when attending to the behaviors all right so the last c is connection the way the, the things that are you do, do that you are doing now are actually very good. No? That means that um, this one, this uh, webinar has been requested from a community of um, parents and families of children with autism. So you are connecting with each other. But there are other persons you can connect with and other institutions and other centers and other um, uh, entities actually that we can connect with. Like, for example, you can connect with the community as in your own community where you are you know, and try as much as you can to also show them how you care for your children with special needs. You know, because the way they see you care for them is the way they will also treat your children and treat your family. Right. So if you include them, you know, um, each and every time there are activities in the community, you can include them because you want them connected with others, then uh, what happens is, you know, they're just plainly part of the community. No one will say that they have a disability and they should not, you know, that discrimination will um, fade away, you know, when that happens. Connection also means getting connected also with the people around you, even just at home. So involve everybody at home, mommies, most especially, or even uh, daddies, no? Do not... Um, do not just do not think that your child is a punishment towards yourself so you don't share it with others because you don't want your other children to suffer why will they suffer when they have your child but the, your child was given to your family and not just to you so you can you know come together as a family who knows that will actually unite your family no, and this is the right time for them to be able to care for their sibling, not when they grow older, not when they are about to leave the house, not when you yourself, parents, are you know, getting older and not being able to take care of your children. You have to expose them now, and you have not just expose, but you have to involve them now and tell them that this, this actually is helping you. Because in the end, when your, ch when your sibling gets to be in your care, you will not have such a difficult time anymore because you have been with him or her from the very start. 
Okay, that will also teach your children otherness. Other that typically developing children will get connected with their own emotions, with their own uh, possibilities, and maximize their own possibilities when it comes to taking care of um, their sibling with disabilities or sibling with uh, special needs. So it doesn't, you know, necessarily have to be a burden to everybody. No, that the child is there. Consider the child as part of the family, and in and in and in, and in, 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 in an in inclusive perspective the child should also participate in everything are, uh, in the house in at home diba? don't consider your child special by way of putting him in a throne and you know giving him everything he wants just so he sits down and you know does not um cause any trouble with others if you keep on doing that then there's a good possibility that when trouble comes everybody will hate the child with special needs in the house. And then you, you force everybody to love the CSN. How can you love somebody like that? Diba? So love has to come from, first of all, accepting that you have the child uh, in your midst, that the child is a gift to you. And because it's a gift to you, you should also consider involving others because they will find that you know um, having the child in their life also gives them some kind of peace and comfort and gives them the chance to be able to partake of that particular gift, okay? So connecting right now is very important. Even with your specialists, if you haven't, been, if you haven't gone to your specialists lately, if you haven't connected with other families who have special needs children, even if, uh, you know, they are, they are of different uh, disabilities, if you haven't connected lately with your other family members, now is the time, okay? So they get to know you, get to know your life with the child that you are caring for, no? All right, so with that said, what do we always say? It takes a village to raise a child. We always hear that, right? But I do believe that, for starters, no? It takes one family to plant the seed. No one can raise any child when there's no planting of anything. So like the true plantitas that we are, <laughs> for those of you who are already plantitas, okay, make sure that you are filled. Where is that? I know. Make sure that you are the can that is filled for you to be able to come up with strategies and things to teach your children. So equip yourself so that you'll be able to share as well for your child that is the plant here in the context where the child is. And right now that is the home for you to be able to connect as well with others because you know that in the end, you need a community to be able to help you raise your child. Thank you. Okay, I can take in questions now. Hmm. Mommy, Mommy, Josie, we can't hear you. Okay, okay thank there. you, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Lutze, actually, sobrang dami. Parang sobrang dami information sa. <laughs> na talagang I really, really like. Okay. Especially. Na, na, actually, overload ba? Ko, overload. Uh, a little, but I have lots of takeaways. And I think <laughs> I'm going to uh, look at them one, one by one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to look at it more deeply one by one like on the ieps and the, my biggest takeaway tonight is the placement I, I really like that subject that you have uh, uh yeah. bring up that placement thing home and being part of the routine sobrang dami actually i already listed all of them so good <laughs> Um, okay. Actually, may mga babasahin ako ditong... Question? Sige. Uh, actually, hindi question. Ah, hindi question. Ang mga comment. Okay, mm -hmm. sabi dito uh, from Juvie Jean Diaz. Hello in Dilutse. That's my cousin. <laughs> proud, of you. Yeah. Proud, of, proud of you. Continue your advocacy to children with special needs. Ayan. Yes. So, mayroong isang mami dito from Mami Mitch Casavilla, sabi niya, 
it widens my perspective, Doc, and aim to do more on training my child. Okay, sabi niya. Then, from Mami Ange, Ange, Angeliza, thanks for this wonderful talk, sabi niya. And then, from Mami Maria Isa, thank you so much for a very informative talk. Actually, sobrang daming informations talaga. Talagang, oh, nai. Actually, I could have said more, pinipigilan ko lang yung sarili ko. <laughs> Sabi ko nga, I think we should have a part two. <laughs> Kasi ang dami eh. Uh, you, like, uh, Nag-message siya nga ako sa ano natin, sa inbox natin sa Zoom. Ah, ganun? Sa chat? Uh, hindi yata nabasa ni Doc Lutz eh. Oh, yeah, I, I, I didn't say uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> The second Actually, part daw. May part yeah. two. Yung, yung sinabi mo, Doc Lutz, yung na routine, I really like that. Sana if you could... Give us that also. Yeah. yeah, you have said that. Uh, you have lots of things about. Please take them down. I'm not taking note. Huh? Ah, I have take, taken it down. Na uh, yung routine. Because we really need that. Parents really need the mm-hmm. routines. No, yung sa mga kids namin. You know what I always say? Nga eh, the routine, you know, solves 50% of our problem when it comes to intervention. 50%. Yes. Ayan no, sabi ni Maria Isim, sana may kasunod pa po para mas marami kaming ma-learn. Ayan. Sabi nito, Doc, paano malalaman if yung school natatanggap ng inclusive placement? From Mami Shi. Oh, well, you have, you have, first of all, you have to get that from the school. You have to interview the school. You have to ask. Okay, there are, uh, there are guidelines as to how a uh, school becomes inclusive. So maybe I can share that next time. No, but um, siguro offhand lang. Um, an inclusive school will take your child for his age alone. I mean, there are no other requirements. Walang admissions requirement but the age. So the school will just ask you, how old is your child? You say six. And then the school says, okay, grade one. The, the school will not look at your wheelchair or the 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 hand movements and all the inappropriate behaviors for them to be able to place you properly they just need to know the age that's inclusive a school that is inclusive does not fail okay so no failing grades no retention they don't retain uh, retain in um uh, grade level placement so no retention no grade repetition but they go through schooling by merit, meaning the school finds ways, you know, like that bank, <laughs> the school finds ways for the school to be able to get to, to give the child a grade. So maybe the, child, uh, the, the school can base the grades on the performance of the child every you know, quarter or something like that. You know? that the school allows AMI. What is AMI? Accommodation, modification, individualization of lessons. So they don't necessarily have to force the gen ed curriculum on your child. No? They can they allow the modification of the lessons so that your child still learns uh, in school. No, we don't want to put children in inclusive schools and just let them sleep the whole time or let them move around and then just say, that, ah, you know, we are inclusive, so don't mind him. No, the child really has to be engaged and be involved and participate in whatever activities there are in school. No exemptions. It's true. I think I have a follow-up question on that. Go no, ahead. How, how can we know that a certain school is already ready to be inclusive? Ah, okay. Well, for one, your specialist should be able to tell you. Kasi diba I said um, school placement is something that assessment results will uh, inform you about. So the specialist who does your child's assessment should be able to tell you what schools are available. So like in the clinic where I am uh, involved in right now, I we make sure that when we make recommendations, you always have options. So parent, here are your options. These are the schools now that are practicing inclusion why? Because we have feedback from other parents who know that they are there already and who give us feedback as to the kind of inclusion. You know, sometimes I say the kind of inclusion. There's no, there should be no kind of inclusion. But you know, in the Philippines, there is still that you know, kind of inclusion because 
not every school that says that it's inclusive actually practice inclusion the way it should. Okay, so, before, yeah. Doc, before I read the next question, I think we only, we have at least tatlo na lang eh. Okay, okay. dalawa na lang. But can we, can we, can I just do very quickly lang, um, an announcement. Very quickly sure, lang. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, mga parents, hold on. Sandali lang po. I'll just, do a very important announcement before we continue the question and answer. Okay, so announcement po, announcement tayo, ayan. So first of all, we have Autism Family Support live prayer on Friday. Every Friday we do this at 8.30 in the evening because we believe that we must approach things not just by science but also by faith because uh, there's always miracle in praying, in praying and believing in God. So every Friday po yan, 8.30. And then on Saturday, October 30, uh, Connections of Love Part 2. So we have a free parents coaching on Saturday on Connections of Love Part 2. So please, if you haven't attended yet uh, this free parents coaching, please do. It's just uh, free. On Zoom, just download and uh, just screenshot this passcode and meeting ID. Okay, it's in our events. And then next Wednesday, we have, uh, we're not going to do it on Wednesday. In Philippine time, it's going to be on uh, Thursday morning. Okay, so because our guest is a, a US base, an American US base, and she's a therapist. So our, our topic on November 4, 8 a.m. in the morning is sensory processing disorder. So it, uh, we are also catering those who are outside the Philippines. That's why we are at 8 a.m. by this time. So, and I would like to give you the wisdom quote of the night. Wisdom quote from the word of God. Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. That's Proverbs 16 verse 3. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs 3 verse 6. Now we always acknowledge and commit whatever we're planning and whatever we are uh, concerned about to the Lord. And lastly, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So whatever our concern about, it's, it's always good and wonderful to, to always have knowledge and understanding of the science part. But uh, most of the times when we put our trust in the Lord, we know that uh, we, are, uh, we have the wisdom, we have the, the guidance he provides for everything, and we have the strength. So can we just uh, have this prayer at this time? Let's pray. Let's pray all together. Dear, dear Lord Jesus, I commit myself to you. I acknowledge you. I acknowledge that you are the source of my strength and wisdom. Guide me in my everyday life, especially in, my, in helping my child with special needs. Thank you that you are my help and my provisions. Thank you that you care not just for my child, but even for me. Forgive me for not depending on you most of the times. Jesus, I believe you are God and Savior, and I receive you in my heart. Lead me and help me to follow you every day. Amen. 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 Okay, so stop share. So thank you for that intermission. So right now, I have this, I'm going to read this question from Mommy Lilia. She said, how would I bring my child to a regular school if there is a requirement like kindergarten, there is a need for them to write or tell their name. This is on the perspective of inclusive uh, education. Okay. So first of all, if they have requirements for your child with special needs, they are not inclusive. <laughs> because as I've said, as I've said, the only, what do you call that? The only requirement is for you to be able to say the age of yes. your child and then that's it. 
So the true kind of inclusion is something that will not ask you for anything. In fact, your child um, will be admitted in that particular, in that specific grade level, and your child will now be given the uh, modified lessons if there's a need. Now, remember what I said, yung AMI, yung accommodations, modification, modification. individualization. Um, the, the, the school and the teacher should be able to provide that for your child once the child is there. Now, uh, some schools, um, because after all, uh, inclusive education as UNCRPD uh, wishes it to be, it should be something that the, uh, that the, what do you call this, that the countries should be able to customize for themselves. So like in the Philippines, another way to, uh, for us to be able to put our children in uh, gen ed inclusive classes uh, and to make the stay of your child there successful is to provide the child with a shadow teacher or other instructional schemes. So a, a shadow teaching is an instructional scheme where a teacher goes with your child in that class so that the teacher can do all the modifications, the individualizations that needs to be done, including managing your um, child uh, for the behaviors that the child needs. Although that's not uh, like a, like a, you know, for everything. You know? It depends also on the one who does your assessment. So your specialist will tell you your child does not need one anymore or your child needs one or it's time to transition or it's time to fade or things like that. So all of those things, you know, all of those decisions that you need to make still should be based on assessment results. When your child has been assessed and the findings say that your child needs a shadow teacher or needs um, probably a pull out also, you know, it's also an instructional scheme then you follow that, no? it, even when the school is inclusive. Because we cannot expect all our teachers, our gen ed teachers, to be able to attend to our children with special needs because they are not trained for that. Although um, the Inclusive Act will now be a law anytime soon. It's, really, it's in the Senate. It has had um, so many ano na, revisions and we are involved, the UP College of Education SPED area is involved in, uh, in uh, the making of that uh, law. No? So once that's already out, then schools will need, will need to be inclusive, meaning they need to be trained and to transform into inclusive uh, schools. So they, uh, you know, they should accommodate, they should be able to accommodate children with special needs no questions asked. No more of the requirements and all of those things. Well, we yeah. hope we, we are really hoping that that will happen soon. But we know it's yeah. really not that easy to prepare. It is not yeah. easy. Yeah. Or, you know that's why that's why. Um, well, th this this is quite a good break for me that I'm talking to parents and families, no. Because most of the time I talk to schools, to teachers, and everything. No, so I always tell them, it's now the time for you to start moving, start training your teachers, start being inclusive already. Because being inclusive is not an overnight thing. You cannot say on Friday that we will be inclusive, inclusive, and then you open on Monday and then you say we're inclusive. It's not like that. No, it has to. You have to have a lot of preparation to be able to do that. So I'm just hoping that the schools are now realizing that because, you know, you can be sued. When, once the law is out and you say children cannot be accommodated in your school just because you're not ready, you can be sued for it. And they can also be sued if they uh, treat the children, I mean, in a very, I mean, doing in not, not, not in an inclusive yeah. way. Yes, yeah, that's right. right. I, I, I am a I John that. Eh. That's why we're... Yeah, we're quite busy also trying to train many schools, naman, in fair, many schools are already asking us to help them, knowing that, you know, the inclusive, inclusive law is almost going to be passed. I thank you, Lord. Very, we will really pray for that. Yeah, we, we should, we should for our children. Yeah, actually, one of the questions here of Mom, Mommy Chari is, is there a mm -hmm. list of schools that is inclusive? I think that's the last question we have right now. Well, I know of schools that are authentically inclusive, no, but I usually only tell when we already have assessment results. 
we we should assess children first before we I know. But of course, I know of schools that are, and there are quite plenty naman na the schools. <laughs> okay, so Doc Luce, we really appreciate you. Just like what Teacher Grace, Teacher Grace, you can unmute yourself. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Doc Lutze. Oh, thank you for sharing your time. Yes. Thank you, Alex. Yes, we, we really learned a lot. A lot. Actually, I, nga, eh. I will look into this more because I have lots of points that I will really chew on yeah. and look more. You sleep and... well tonight, then tomorrow you read your notes. And, and yeah. So, Doc, uh, hoping really to have a part two from you <laughs> hopefully okay. please we will look into that schedule yeah. lang yan. If, you know naman schedule schedule. So, yeah if if you have a good schedule now we, we can wait parents are just here we're just waiting every wednesday we do this please okay. you check on me from yeah. time to time gracie okay. you check on me okay, from time no, to time. where can they reach you yeah, oh, I can they reach something. you. Like yeah. they want to visit your like online evaluation. How can they contact uh, you? Through Grace, <laughs> I will. Ano, <laughs> I will give Grace the ano the contact person, our secretary. Um, if you want to get into psychoeducational assessment, I I actually am involved in psychoeducational assessment under um Doctor Ed Bison, who is the father of psychoed assessment in the Philippines. So he's actually it's only his clinic who does psychoed assessment. Um we just don't advertise it because we have by sa ngayon pa lang we have plenty of um, clients already. So ang difficult nung scheduling. Pero of course I encourage you to have your children assessed talaga. But when you do you choose the kind of assessment that's comprehensive and will actually be able to give you recommendations towards all of those that I said, especially when it comes to the IEP. It should be, it, the assessment should be, it should have an output that is IEP ready, meaning the recommendations um, of what the child needs to learn, how the child needs to learn, the guidelines that the parents and all other intervention providers should follow are all there. Ganun dapat ka comprehensive. Wow. Okay. So, thank you, Doc. And thank you, <laughs> Teacher thank you Grace. So much, and too. thank you to all the parents who join us tonight. So, parents, um, have yeah. a good night rest. And then you can all... I'm going to put this in our YouTube, official YouTube channel, Autism Family. So, Somebody replay? There's a replay for yeah. this? Because some are yeah. asking. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. we're going to put it there and also put it in our page again in, and in our group so you can uh, replay on them and chew on them more. So okay. have a good night, rest And thank, thank you, you so much, much, parents. Thank you for having me. Parents, thank you so much. As okay, much as you take care you. of your children, yes, take care yes, of yourself. Take care. Yes. Bye. 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 Uh, Teacher Grace, thank you so yes. much. Oh, thank you. Okay, God bless. Ayan, God bless you tayo. all. Thank you. <laughs> Doc, pwede, na, pwede na tanggalin yung recording. Nag-record ka pa ba dun saan? Ay, teka muna. <laughs> Shout out sa lahat ng mga nagpapa-shout out. Yeah, I won't shout. say your names anymore. May mga nagme-message sa akin. 